focus a lot of attention on um, as we kind of tend to tend to stick to the consumer side but um, there's a lot of a lot of space out there for discussing uh, the b2b and social ads and so hopefully today we'll give you a good taste of what um, some of the core platforms are doing out there to help uh, the b2b marketers Before we get started, a few quick logistics. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll email out a link, uh, usually within 24 or 48 hours. Definitely feel free to ask any questions uh, via the chat option and any un unanswered questions that, that we can't get to. Um, we will definitely respond to following the webinar. And by all means, reach out um, to me directly if you know if any questions come up um, after we're all all done today. First, a uh, little bit about Pointit. Uh, we were founded in 2002. We are a Seattle-based digital marketing agency. Uh, core services focusing on SEM, SEO display web and landing page development, uh, as well as social advertising, obviously, mobile marketing. We service clients across all verticals and revenue, revenue models. And for those of you who are lucky enough to be in Seattle next week for SMX Advanced, um, please stop by our booth. I hear we're giving away an iPad mini, so there's some incentive there to, to come and join us, say hello, um, join us for, for some of the, the after um, the parties in the evening and, and networking events. So a quick agenda. Um, looking at sort of the social ads and the B2B space, currently some, some high-level thoughts. And then we'll, we'll jump into to LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And just so everyone knows, you know, we're not, this isn't um, kind of a social ads 101 in the sense that we're going to walk through steps in terms of how to build, build ads, et cetera, in each of these platforms, but more what tools are available for for the B2B B2B advertiser specifically um, within within the three of these these platforms. So, you know, we we I think it's kind of a, a funny question that I propose <laughs> here in terms of you know B2B and isn't it supposed to be social? Um, as we know, B2B is all about relationships, building relationships building trust and so it's in a, in a way um, kind of funny that it's taken so long for B2Bs to to adopt uh, social ad platforms um, in order to reach their to reach their customers to nurture uh, to find to basically find the right audience I mean obviously there are there are some reasons why it's why it's taken a while hopefully we'll cover cover some of those in this webinar um, but others include you know we know that Sales cycles for B2B products are often much longer uh, than consumer-focused ones. They're often more expensive, and they, they typically require multiple individuals and teams getting involved. And so, you know, for all those reasons and, and more, um, we can't just put out a tweet or put a face, you know, Write a Facebook post and just expect that that um, our leads are going to come come flowing in. Um, there's a lot more behind the B2B process than than um, simply trying to you know push product or the latest sale. So hopefully before before I kind of jump into some additional slides, I want to do a really quick poll, and so I'm hoping um, everyone can go ahead and see this. And if you have have a second, uh, go ahead and choose one of these options. Um, basically, just want to get a sense of where folks are at in terms of using social ads specifically for for B two B marketing. Um, I know my my gut is telling me there's been a lot of trial and error, and that's kind of where the majority of folks are going <laughs> are to fall, um, and there's, you know, very good reasons for that. So this will just kind of help us uh, determine, you know, which, what to focus on during the webinar and, and which aspects of it we should, we should push a bit more. So the results are, are coming in, and... 
I'm happy to see the responses. Um, the majority <laughs> look like, you know, they've tried but didn't see great results. Um, or there's there's a lot of you out there who are interested, who are very interested and inclined to get started using these platforms, but just don't know where to begin. So hopefully, hopefully we'll cover some of these items um, as we move through the webinar. So this was, I was reading uh, the, on the Forrester site the other day and came across some content. And I think this sort of hits the, the you know, the nail in terms of where social ads falls into the, the digital, the online marketing mix. Um, there is this, I, this notion that um, social ads can't find the right audience, and you know that's just simply not not the case anymore. As of, as the the platforms are definitely maturing and expanding their offerings. Um, but what I what I want to really call out here is you know how how do you find the right buyers, and how do you produce results, and at the end of the day, how do you grow the bottom line? Um, you know we we often have this internal debate around which channel is most effective, you know, search, display, or social. And a year ago, two years ago, that would be, you know, search, fall by display, social was sort of a distant third. And I think what's happening is social is, is starting to overtake display and then kind of move into, you know, in some cases even competing with competing with search. And the reason being, social isn't a whole lot different than some of the other than most of the other digital platforms out there in terms of finding the right audience, uh, influencing purchase decisions, you know, nurturing existing relationships, the scale and scale and automation is vastly improving. Then of course, you know, how do we measure all this at the end of the day? So it's far more than likes and follows. Um, you know, it's one of those I th uh, myths that, you know, we, we don't want to run social ads. We're, we have no interest in, in building up the number of likes on our Facebook page or the number of follows on our, on our Twitter page. And so thankfully, you know, social ads is just playing a much larger role in the entire funnel. Um, from awareness all the way down down to the purchase phase, and then of course you know not necessarily as relevant for the B two B space, but the sharing aspect um, after purchase is also playing a role at least on the consumer side. And so social ads, I, the the point of the slide is that it plays a role across the entire the entire funnel. Something else that I think we forget is, you know, the, the impact that social has um, on the, the mobile environment, which of course we know is um, exploding at, at the moment. Hold on, I just want to see if we have some technical issues. Sorry, I was having some, some screen issues here. So um, the reason, you know, we, we there's been a lot of studies recently. This most recent one was from, from Facebook showing the percentage of adults who are switching screens during the day um, and just highlighting the fact that mobile devices are, you know, becoming the sort of go-to device. Uh, we, we know that's the case. You know, all of us wake up in the morning turn on our phones, see if we have any emails, check our social networks, etc. But the point the point here is that that's it's on twenty four hours a day. And so even for the B2B space, we're finding that we can reach these the perch the the decision makers, you know, pretty much at any given time. And while they may not continue to use their mobile device, um, 
to do the research phase or look into the products, et cetera, they're most likely going to then, you know, jump on their laptop, jump on their computer, um, have conversations internally at, you know, within their business. So the, we just have to be aware that we can reach, you know, the right audience on, as they're on their mobile device at pretty much any, at all times of the day. <clears throat> So let's look at LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into LinkedIn, and we'll make our way through Twitter and Facebook. Obviously, LinkedIn is the preferred network for professionals. Um, we're all very aware of that. So I'm not going to give you know LinkedIn 101 in terms of how to set up um, ads from, from start to finish, but more just look at like what do you need to know where can you focus your time, and why Why is LinkedIn so popular for B2B marketers? So forget standard ads. Um, six months ago, a year ago, I probably would not have made this claim, um, but at this point, I'm starting to, <laughs> mostly because of uh, experience and what we're seeing as just um, results that, that are becoming less and less effective. Um, they're more expensive. We're seeing extremely low CTR, which in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but the fact is they they're require almost daily optimizations. And so, you know, you look at this combination of factors that I have to pay higher CPCs um, for relatively low volume and something that requires almost daily optimizations. Personally, to me, it's not worth it. Now, again, six months, a year ago, uh, we were actually getting fairly good results from standard ads. And for for a specific client, we were hitting their CPA targets um, that were being uh, applied across search as well. So sponsored updates is really where it's at when it comes to LinkedIn ads. And, you know, these aren't necessarily new. Uh, they've been around for a little while now. But the more and more we use them for our clients, the more and more we um, you know, are really starting to ignore the standard ads. The benefits of sponsored updates, uh, number one, you know, promoting content directly, directly in the feed. And so you know, it's front and center. Um, the ad unit itself is far more engaging. You have the ability you know, to create a headline, images, uh, body text as well. Signi we're seeing significantly higher CTR than standard ads. Generally, lower CPCs uh, than standard ads as well. But LinkedIn is still one of those channels where we're finding um, does tend to be a bit more expensive than than the other channels. Keep in mind, um, as with any of these any of these channels. These ads are social, and so people can like them, yes, but you know more importantly, people can and will comment on your ad and so I can almost guarantee some of those are going to be negative as well <laughs> and so if you are not prepared to engage with your customer to respond to comments, then save us all the trouble and um, disappointment of potential potential or even existing customers and and don't run social ads I mean it's just it's a fact of life when it comes when it comes to to these types of ad units whether it's LinkedIn Twitter or Facebook um, people are going to engage engage with with the ads and you know overall in the whole scheme of things it's going to be a relatively low percentage and the fact of the matter is to the majority of people who do comment are probably going to be negative, although that's not, not always the case. Um, so just something that you need to be aware of. So here, here's really the reason why LinkedIn is so, is so powerful uh, for the B2B marketer, and it, it just comes down to the targeting that's available. Whether it's you know, looking at specific companies, job titles, um, schools, skills, groups, you have the ability to really 
filter down to the the people that you that you really want to to want to reach. Um, you know, the decision makers at companies that are most likely going to um, approve or disapprove of of what it is that you're that you're trying to sell. Um, you can you can mix and match all of these levels of different targeting. Just keep in mind, obviously, the more specific you get, the smaller and smaller that LinkedIn audience will get as well. Um, you know, it's very very easy to to find yourself filtering down to where your audience size is maybe a thousand people. Um, you know, a thousand, two thousand LinkedIn members, and and it does get a bit challenging to to gain any sort of volume. Out of that, um, the argument there is that is that your your audience is much more targeted, and therefore, hopefully, you know, more likely to to engage with your content. So when you're after you've gone through and created your LinkedIn campaigns, you will see um, your campaign settings, and this kind of gives you just a quick overview of. Campaign name, media types, um, collect leads, which we'll discuss here in a second. Your ability to rotate ad variations. So not too long ago, um, Twitter only gave you the option to, well, it did it for you, where it just optimized ads based on CTR. Now they've given you the option where you can rotate ver ad variations evenly, which is great, especially for us search marketers where we're so accustomed to A-B testing. Um, that Twitter has rolled that in as well. You know, compared to the other platforms, Twitter um, and Facebook, that still don't have that that ability. Um, it's it's refreshing that LinkedIn is giving giving us this option. So you kind of get an overview of your audience, uh, the the volume based on the targeting, the what you're targeting, whether it's group, companies, etc. And then your campaign settings as well. Um, general general stuff that, that will be applied across, you know, whatever channel it is that you're running. So I mentioned the lead collection option. And for those of you who have never tried this, this is kind of what it looks like. These are some standard ads that appeared on my wall. Um, thankfully, they were relatively targeted, uh, well targeted, you know, maybe other than the then the We Speak IT, um, the landing page optimization, and the PPC management software, both pretty, pretty much on the mark. Um, what I, another reason why I don't like standard ads is you have no idea who's actually um, running these ads unless they happen to put it in their, you know, within the banner, within the text or the headline. You're, you know, it's sort of this mystery, which I really, really don't like. Um, but in the case of, of the, the top ad unit here, um, go went ahead and clicked on it. Quizio is obviously including the option to collect leads. So basically a little banner pops up just asking um, pretty non-intrusively, you know, are you okay if a Quizio uh, reaches out to, to contact you on LinkedIn? So definitely an option. We have not done a lot of testing with that, with that piece um, simply because... Um, the clients don't necessarily want to test it. Um, the volume there is a little bit questionable, but you know, I would, I mean, honestly, like to at some point give it a give it a test to see see how it does. So, just some quick sort of updates, uh, sponsor updates, sort of tricks and tips and tricks. Um, some of these are very obvious: clear value proposition, and call to action. You know. It's amazing how many ads we'll see where this isn't necessarily clear. Um, the landing page must match the content of the ad and the offer. Again, very straightforward, very obvious. Uh, there was an ad that, was, that came up uh, within my newsfeed a few weeks ago where you know the ad itself looked okay, but then you start scrolling down to the comments and you immediately see there was not a lot of QA done because the link to the to the landing page didn't work, um, and then yeah, people were commenting that it was like a totally different page. So make sure that everything lines up. Do the QA before you push it out. We do recommend a social calendar, you know, and of course this is across all the platforms. Um, 
but with with LinkedIn, it's I th potentially important because it can get uh, a little confusing at times if you if you're starting to push out a lot of posts. Um, but the reason being is there are some frequency caps that Twitter does not really disclose, or sorry, that LinkedIn does not disclose at all, and that is around um, the fact that a user can only see up to four updates from a single company page within a 48-hour period. So if you have one post that you push out there, um, you know, of course this is going to depend on the size of the audience that you're targeting, but if you only have one post, it's very it, likely that it's not going to get nearly as much uh, reach as if you were to push out, you know, two or three posts at a time. And so, as I, as I mentioned here, if you only have one piece of content running, a user only has a chance to get a single post within 48 hours. So, the workaround, the workaround of that is if you don't want to come up with multiple different posts to push out, then you can actually just, you know, create one post, just change the headline, um, just swap out the image, and that is enough to trigger LinkedIn that you have three posts instead of one, and it's far more likely that you will um, get your content out there in front of the right people um, more frequently. Incomplete profiles and exclusion targeting. Um, this is pretty important and not necessarily something you would think about testing um, unless you heard it from someone else. And so what you can do is, you know, LinkedIn allows you to exclude, say, certain industries, say, or certain company sizes. And what we found and has been confirmed by, you know, our own campaigns, but also others that we've talked to in the industry, um, by excluding certain targeting criteria rather than including it, your your audience size will expand greatly and that's because of a lot of um, basically incomplete profiles on LinkedIn where people don't necessarily um, tell LinkedIn, okay, how big is the company that we work for? So taking advantage of the incomplete profiles by using exclusion targeting can actually greatly increase um, the reach of your campaigns. Last but not least, make sure that you're tagging your URLs um, with some type of unique parameter that allows you to track back performance to specific ads and campaigns. Um, obviously, if we can't track the results, then we have no idea whether, whether our campaigns are performing. And yes, this takes time. It, it actually is part of what... Um, requires some of that upfront time and energy, but it is well worth it at the end of the day. So let's move on to Twitter. Um, you know, Twitter definitely falls as number two, I think, when it comes to B2B marketing. And, you know, for good reason. Like, there's a lot of opportunities on Twitter. Um, the Twitter user base tends to be um, fall into that kind of, I think, that, that B2B sort of profile demographic. And so, thankfully, Twitter as well as Facebook, as you'll find out, you know, they're, they're making strides in terms of improving their whole ad network, targeting capabilities, ad units, so that we can, we can reach that B2B um, user. So what do you need to know? There are, I mean, there's a lot to know about Twitter. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to run through how to create a promoted tweet um, and the different targeting options because there's a few core core aspects that as B2B marketers um, we'd need to be aware of. The first is tailored audiences, um, otherwise known as retargeting. And so what Twitter now offers is the ability to um, re-message to, to people based on um, certain criteria. They basically give us three options where we can use cookie IDs, uh, which is which is website visitors. Um, we can use email addresses or we can use Twitter IDs. None of this is available in the actual um, UI. You, need, you do need to have a partnership with some of these third parties. And so 
you know, I my guess is that Twitter is going to start to um, update some of these options so that you can basically create, for example, website visitors using a Twitter pixel um, rather than having to go through, you know, an ad roll or blue Kai, et cetera. Um, similar with email addresses, you know, as we'll, as we'll talk about here shortly, Facebook basically has the same, the same options here, but all of it's, can be can be accomplished directly through their UI. My guess is Twitter is going to move in that direction, um, but we'll see. Uh, this is probably you know a short-term fix um, for for Twitter open up additional uh, targeting targeting options. But the point being here that you now have um, really strong capabilities to reach a whole different realm of, of visitors, whether it's people who are coming to your site, looking, taking action on your site, downloading white papers, case studies, um, being able to upload email addresses, save current customers, for example, and maybe remarketing to them with product updates or maybe some new research that came out um, claiming the benefits of your tools, whatever it may be. Second on the, on the list of things that you need to know are Twitter cards. And so for those of you who, who have not experimented with these at all, um, it's not necessarily a paid only component. Um, Twitter cards are available via paid or, not, or sort of organic. Um, it's actually a piece of code that you can put on your website and it allows to basically enhance tweets with some more interactive sort of engaging content. For the sake of this webinar, we'll look at lead gen uh, cards. Website cards are also available. Um, but more importantly, these are available directly in the ads dashboard. And as you'll see, they're very simple to set up. So a very, very quick slide on Twitter's ad ecosystem. Let me see here. Hold on just a sec. I think we're having some technical issues. Okay, so hopefully that is back on your screen now. Um, so we'll look. So again, you know, Twitter's Twitter's ecosystem is really revolves around um, two main types of targeting. I did not include promoted trends in here unless you have 100k to spend on a daily basis. Um, so the majority of us are going to really focus on the promoted tweets side of things um, in terms of you know how do we get our message out in front of those who matter at the right moment? How do we amplify any existing, maybe organic um, tweets that have gone out and are seeing really high engagement rates? Promote accounts is how do you grow your community? How do you get more followers? Um, and then, you know, there's a little, there's another option there for pinning a tweet to the top of your profile. Uh, it's totally free. Basically, you can pin any tweet that you want so that when people visit your profile page, you know, that's a tweet they'll see. So if you're pushing a product, um, there's big news news uh, announcement, um, whatever, the, whatever that may be. You know, it's just a quick little setting, pin it to the top of your profile page. Generally, you won't see a huge lift in volume, but it's there um, to take advantage of. So tailored audiences. This is really, we've been doing a lot of um, testing with tailored audiences probably over the last three, four, five months. Um, and what we're finding is they can work really well. Um, the challenge is it's volume um, tends to be an issue unless you have some really, really big lists that you're, that you're building your campaigns around. Um, and there's definitely some uncertainty around, okay, how are they going to perform? Is the targeting really, truly working? Um, but based on what we're seeing so far with the clients that we're running uh, tailored audiences through, it's, it's performing pretty well. 
And so basically what what Twitter is allowing you to do is, so in this example, we're pulling in Blue Kai audience data um, for a client, integrating that with Twitter, and then we're allowed to basically choose those audiences that we want to target um, with a specific tweet. So this is all website data. So these are visitors who have come to the site, taken some sort of action, um, visited a specific page. Unfortunately, at this time, you cannot, for tailored audiences, exclude, say, converters. Um, I've been told that they're coming out with that option. Still haven't seen it. Um, so at this point, depending on how you build your audiences in Blue Kai, um, you may not be able to exclude, say, someone who who is um, downloading a white paper, or filling out a lead form, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the other challenge that we often deal with, at least with, with Blue Kai, is you see a bunch of numbers in Twitter rather than any sort of specific name, uh, campaign names or, or audience names. So you have, to, you have to keep a list in Excel, whatever, with what these numbers correlate to in terms of those visitors. So Twitter cards um, are, are a really cool, sort of innovative, engaging way to drive um, to drive action that, that you're really going after. And so Web Trends was kind of one of the first to prove that these can be really effective um, in lead gen. And so this study is out there uh, pretty much anywhere, anywhere on the web. You can quickly look it up. Um, but what they showed was that, that given the right messaging, the right content, you know, the right timing, that you can... that you can really drive um, drive actions from a, from a lead gen, from a B2B perspective um, by, by just putting together the, the right plan. Lead gen cards are really easy to set up. Um, surprisingly so, uh, within the ads UI, there's literally four or five, six fields that you need to input the messaging uh, for uploading an image. You do need a link to your privacy policy um, within the tweet is within the, the card as well. You can customize like the call to action, uh, short description, etc. The obvious benefits of lead gen cars are that because the user is logged into Twitter, when they see these, it's a one click um, option and basically that you will capture the user's name, username, and email address. Twitter tracks all that for you. You do have the option of having that data automatically sent to like a CRM system, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Twitter will track all the engagements, you know, everyone who has, who has downloaded um, or viewed this card. Uh, super easy to download it right to Excel and all that information is right there. You have Twitter IDs, Again, name, username, email address, very powerful stuff. Um, our recommendation is, you know, if you're thinking about testing these, um, maybe try and coincide it with some type of event in your industry. Um, you know, it's often the case where at a, at a conference, um, for example, we were at PPC Hero in Austin not too long ago, for about the week leading up to PPC Hero, I mean, you start seeing endless tweets about the conference. Um, could be a really great time to set up a campaign around those, you know, related hashtags, push your card, um, you know, you got a pretty captive audience there, and, and kind of gauge, you know, those, those results. I mean, you can apply Twitter cards to any of the, any of the campaign types, whether it's keyword targeted, campaigns, um, whether you're going after an interest or looking for the influencers in your market, um, you can run those as well. Promoted only tweets. So this is basically the option for you to publish a post that's only going to be part of an ad campaign. And um, this is great so you're not saturating your followers uh, with content especially if you're trying to test multiple forms of messaging. Um, basically, this allows you to write as many as you want um, and then 
promote them only as part of a campaign that you're running. Now, that being said, these are live in the, the Twitter sphere, <laughs> so to speak. So while your followers may not see them, somebody else, for example, could be doing a search. Like they could find this promoted only tweet. Um, but again, the point of these this option is that you're not, you know, constantly pushing out content to your followers who may or may not um, be be interested at all in, in what you're trying to say here. Um, and then with these with these promote only tweets, you can attach Twitter cards directly to them. So you basically have the option of compl of creating a completely custom ad unit um, with your with your content with the Twitter cards. Remember, you are charged for every form of engagement on a promoted tweet. And this is actually the same across LinkedIn and Facebook. So whether that is a retweet, a comment, reply, um, a photo, image view, etc., you are charged for every click on your ad unit. If your goal is to only drive people to your website, remove any sort of clickable content uh, within your tweet and just put your URL. Um, I can guarantee you you're going to see a drop in engagement rates, but the trade-off is hopefully you know a more engaged engaged audience. So we're going to jump into Facebook. Um, you guys have been patient and listening to me for a while now, so <laughs> we will really just going to focus on some of the what I see are key updates to the Facebook Ads platform that is better suited for the B2B, the B2B audience. And obviously, Facebook is going after LinkedIn um, with, with a lot of these updates. Um, but then again, but their custom audience piece, which has been around for a little while, um, and they were the first to offer that type of um, targeting and is, uh, can be extremely, extremely powerful. So we'll look at uh, campaign objectives, ad sets, some of the demographic targeting, unpublished posts, which is basically uh, similar to Twitter's promoted posts, and then some custom audiences. Really quick slide on uh, Facebook's ad ecosystem. So not too long ago, they, they basically updated their campaign structure with the addition of ad sets. And, you know, initially I was a bit hesitant, kind of, you know, under my breath, kind of screaming at Facebook for, for it, but it it does mirror, you know, what we see in search, um, which is good. Basically, it gives us a little bit more control over over budgeting, scheduling, et cetera. Um, some of the biggest downfalls of this new campaign structure is that you have to pick your objective at the campaign level. And so the objectives are down there, that screenshot to the bottom left, once you pick your objective, you set your ads live, you can no longer change your objective. Um, and personally, I find that a single campaign may have multiple objectives. So in that case, you have to, you have to set up different campaigns with different objectives, more time, more setup. Um, I, I really hope that Facebook will change that, but I doubt they will. Uh, cue, a few, few quick tips. Um, Facebook is admittedly trying to simplify the whole ad buying process. Thankfully, for those who have been running ads for a while now know it was utterly confusing years ago. Um, they're doing, they are making strides at, at making it just an overall cleaner, better process, not only for us as marketers, but for the users as well. Um, so they're coming up with some universal ad sizes, the 1200 by 627 for news feed ads. Um, works across multiple ad units. There's still no way to rotate ads evenly in Facebook, which is really irritating, especially if you have, you know, potentially hundreds of ads within an ad set. Um, again, you can't change your objective once ads are live. Power Editor, for those who are not using it or who do not know what it is, it's basically a, um, a browser-based editor for making bulk edits, changes um, to all your Facebook campaigns. Highly recommend using that. Uh, so demographic targeting. This is relatively recent. Um, they've, I mean, I think a lot of this has been available. They're pushing it out. They're cleaning it up. And this is where I think there's a direct attack on LinkedIn's uh, targeting capabilities. 
Facebook wants you to come and run ads um, based on sort of the, these work variables. And so that includes employers, job titles, um, industries, office types. Looks very familiar. And that's because, <laughs> because it is. But it is definitely worth trying um, to see how the, you know, what the engagement rates are, you know, really the effectiveness of, of this type of this type of targeting. They've also included certain industries that you can target, um, as well as behaviors, which is really interesting. It's a bit limited currently, um, but you can actually target people who are making some B2B purchase decisions. You know, it's limited to these four right now around business, marketing, uh, maintenance, repair, and operations, office and corporate gifts, training and publications. But it's, but it's there. Uh, we have not tested this yet. Um, if anyone has, I'd be super interested to hear how, how it's doing, what the responses are. Um, but, but Facebook's also, what I think is really helpful, is they're giving you a bit more insight into how they're collecting their data. So where, where are they sourcing this data from? Because that's always been... I think one a, a big issue, a big concern with people is, you know, really how is Facebook getting so much of this third-party data? Now what they've done is, you know, they're giving you a, at least a little blurb in terms of where, where it's coming from. So custom audiences is really what makes this, makes Facebook's um, ad platform fairly powerful because it allows you to... Um, look at multiple ways of reaching reaching your audiences. And so you can upload custom email lists. So you could segment them, you know, a hundred different ways, all of which you can download directly from your CRM system and then upload upload into Facebook. So, you know, this could be current customers, new customers. Again, um, people who have taken some action on on your site. However you aggregate your emails, you can segment them whichever way you want, upload those into Facebook and and create, you know, specific unique content towards that audience. So not only can you use email lists, um, you can then create lookalikes based on various um, uh, sort of trigger points, I, I suppose, in, in Facebook. And so if you have an email list of, say, all your current customers, you can then create a look-alike audience from that list. And you, Facebook gives you two options. One is reach, one is similarity. We always start with similarity. Um, obviously, that reduces the overall reach of that look-alike audience, but, I mean, that's really, the goal is really to find those similar, the similar audiences um, based on, you know, one, customers that you, who you already know are highly relevant to your business. The reach... We're always a bit hesitant when Facebook um, asks us to take their word um, and, and um, expand something that is probably going to show your ad to a lot of irrelevant people. So we tend to stay away from the reach side of the, the lookalike targeting and, and focus just on the similarity piece. Remarketing. So Facebook, as, as many of you probably know, um, started out on what was FBX, uh, Facebook Exchange, obviously still exists uh, today, but not too long ago, Facebook released their own sort of native remarketing options. So now you can take a rem uh, Facebook remarketing pixel and go ahead and place it on your website and remarket to, uh, to visitors, you know, non-converters, page visits, um, say people who have downloaded white papers, case studies, etc. You have full flexibility here in terms of, of who you want to remarket to. Um, and now it's all available to you directly in the ads UI. We still use FBX for a lot of clients, and there's, is, there are a lot of cases where FBX makes sense, especially uh, um, for scale. Uh, if, you're, if you have larger budgets, um, then running through a third party using FBX may make a bit more sense. But if you just want to do some testing, um, go ahead and create create your own remarketing pixel directly in, in Facebook. So it pulls all this together, um, similar to 
to Twitter uh, is, is are these unpublished posts or you know a dark posts? Basically, it's, it allows you to create a post um, that's only going to be part of a, of an ad campaign. So this will not get organic distribution on your page. Um, you have, I mean, you have a lot of flexibility here. You can basically create an entire entirely um, unique ad unit with URL, post text. Link headlines, display links, descriptions, etc. Your own images. Um, Facebook even now allows a call to action button. But this is what kind of pulls everything together. So all your custom audiences, whichever whichever format you're using, you can write you know the post just exactly how you want it, and it will get news feed um, distribution, which is extremely powerful. So as we wrap up, uh, just a few considerations. Again, with all of these channels, you pay for any type of engagement on an ad. So whether that's a click, share, comment, retweet, reply, it's all going to cost you um, some money. And so it's really up to you to decide what's most valuable to you. And if you can't really put a value on any of these sort of levels of engagement, our recommendation is just include the URL um, if possible. And so I can get I can guarantee engagement rates will fall. Um, but again, at least those who are taking action are, are much more likely to um, be uh, uh, higher quality. Facebook ads management tool, um, Quaya. So we are in no way affiliated with them. Um, if you if you're beyond the testing phase and you are running some evergreen campaigns or you just want to invest more in Facebook ads, I highly recommend trying this tool. Um, really inexpensive, so I mean we're talking a hundred bucks, hundred dollars, maybe two hundred dollars a month, depending on the number of ads you push out on a daily basis. But it's a it's purely Facebook ads. Um, the the way that you build campaigns, manage them, report on them is all very fluid um, and pretty intuitive. And remember, um, whether it's B2B or B2C, it's, it's a two-way street. So engage with your customers. If you are not going to respond to comments, um, then you really probably, then, then you shouldn't be, then you really shouldn't be in the space. Um, it's a, we can build relationships, we can nurture relationships, um, but it's a way for for the company to um, respond to be more more um, I guess people like <laughs> um, and not just you know someone behind buying an office space somewhere. So just keep that in mind. Engage with our customers. Their social ads. It's going. It's going to happen. And so that's it. Um, Appreciate everybody staying with us uh, through through the majority of this uh, webinar. I'm just going to go through and see if there are any questions here. Uh, <laughs> tracking and is always is always one of the one of the number one questions. And so my recommendation is at a minimum uh, use Google Analytics so you can. Because of the ability to use promoted posts, um, sorry, to use unpublished posts, um, dark tweets, etc., you have the option to use whatever URL you want, which means you can tag them however you want. So at a minimum, we really recommend using Google Analytics. It's free. It's extremely powerful, and you'll be able to track um, pretty much every, every level form of activity from, from any of these platforms. So again, we will uh, we'll go ahead. We'll get the recording uh, completed for everybody. Send that over within 24, 48 hours. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks a lot.